whatever you're doing, your ability to explain things to people clearly and concisely will uh, be advantageous. Hi, this is Jed McCosco at Academic Influence and Wake Forest University. And today I have an old friend, Professor Matt Terrell, coming to us from Chicago. And uh, I wanted to ask you, Professor Terrell, um, how has it been being a teacher where you're meeting with students and trying to give them information, uh, being a researcher where you're trying to develop new things, and being an administrator trying to get an entire department uh, or, or a group of people moving in a certain direction. So how have each of those things unfolded uh, time-wise in your career? Which ones you've done at different points and how much, um, what, what different skills have they required of you and, and your enjoyment of each of those roles? Yeah, well, I went from uh, defending my PhD dissertation in the middle of August at the University of Massachusetts, drove to Minnesota and became an assistant professor two weeks later. And at the beginning, um, teaching and research are the entire job. And in fact, uh, at major research universities, such as the University of Minnesota, uh, there's a big premium placed on allowing time for you to get your research uh, career off the ground. But, you know, as I've progressed in my career, I, I realized that um, Teaching and research aren't as different as they might seem at first. In, in each case, you're trying to teach somebody something. You know, what we typically call teaching is classroom activity, where you lecture and interact with students in the classroom. But in your research lab, you talk and interact with students in the laboratory, and you try to produce results that teaches the world something about nature or about what nature can do with chemistry or biology or physics or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I think there's a huge premium in both teaching and research on developing clear ways of explaining things. And when I talk to students who are either coming into graduate school or coming out of graduate school into the next phase of their career, I always try to emphasize that, you know, that um, whatever you're doing, your ability to explain things to people clearly and concisely will uh, be advantageous. It, it's You write good papers by writing clearly. You write good proposals by teaching the people who are reviewing them some new things. Uh, so... Uh, in my view, the, the distinction between teaching and research isn't that uh, big. Um, administration is a little different thing. And, uh, you, you know, uh, I worked at the University of Minnesota for 22 years. Um, just before I came there, uh, a, a person, a, a really a giant of chemical engineering, had stepped down as department head, Neil Amundsen, who had been department head for 27 years. And then we had a couple of shorter term department uh, heads. Uh, and then Ted Davis, one of my friends and colleagues, took over for 15 years. So I saw some really excellent, long-term, stable uh, faculty leadership. And then when Ted uh, actually became dean, I was asked to become uh, department head. Uh, so it wasn't so much that I was angling for the job. If I really wanted to move quickly into administration, I probably would have left Minnesota because <laughs> there, there were such long-term people there. But when you work at a place for a while, uh, you start to feel a sense of responsibility. If people want to invest in you as a leader um, and, and you've benefited from being at that place, I mean, that's, that's how it was for me. Um, you know, I was uh, honored, basically, by the request that I become department head. Uh, having said that, and I don't mean to turn this into too long of a monologue, but... Uh, after I was department head for five years, um, I started to get recruited for dean's jobs around the country. And uh, 
1999, 21 years ago, 22 years ago, I um, became Dean of Engineering at UC Santa Barbara, where I was for 10 years. Um, and uh, that really gave me, you know, a kind of a higher level platform to try to guide the building of a faculty and uh, hire people and so on. And um, I, I think the thing that has um, driven me the most toward administration is that I've, I've found that I, I seem to have a knack for convincing faculty members to do what I want them to do. Uh, you know, persuade them to join my university or to engage in research initiatives and, and things like that. So, um, as you know, after 10 years at Santa Barbara, I think we might have almost crossed paths for a short time at Berkeley, where I became chair of uh, bioengineering. And I did that for two years, and I I expected I would still be there right now, except that after uh, about two years, the University of Chicago contacted me saying they wanted to start their first ever engineering program. And I had the honor and responsibility of uh, founding an engineering school, which we now call the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering. So tell us just a little bit before I want to move on to your research. Um, what led the University of Chicago, which has been around for a long time, um, to finally get into engineering? And why hadn't they done it before? Yeah, uh, that's an extremely interesting question. Uh, and the, uh, the, I'll answer the second one first. Um, you know, they uh, had a longstanding, deep feeling of uh, scholarship uh, that, you know, you could sort of perhaps describe as um, knowledge for the sake of knowledge, for producing um, information for society, but that there were other places that could think about the applications. But in 2006, a new president, who's still our president, uh, became president of the University of Chicago. His, his name is Bob Zimmer, Robert Zimmer. And uh, he um, had been a faculty member at the University of Chicago since the 70s. So he knew the University of Chicago's traditions, and he himself is a pure mathematician. But he felt that the university was really missing out by not having engineering and applied science. The way Bob described it to me when I first met him is that uh, basic science is stimulated by engineering and applied science, and the University of Chicago had been missing out on that. The other factor, or one other factor, is that the University of Chicago manages um, Argonne National Laboratory for the Department of Energy, very much like the University of California manages the Mark Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And as we probably both know, the, the interactions between the campus and the lab at Berkeley are very strong. They hadn't been so strong at, uh, at the University of Chicago in Argonne, and we've put a lot of effort into changing that over the last decade. Wow, that's incredible. That that gives me a better picture for what was going on. Just on that Argonne lab thing, was it partly because of the distance that you have to drive in order to get to Argonne National Laboratories compared to just, you know, taking a shuttle bus up the hill to uh, yeah, the, the lab? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've talked about that a lot. I, I think people say that, you know, Argonne is 20 miles away. Um, but... You know, I, I went up the hill a lot when I was at, at Berkeley, you know, and, you know, I walk from my office for five or 10 minutes, wait at the bus stop for five or 10 minutes, ride the bus for five or 10 minutes, and then walk from the bus stop up there to where I was going. So, you know, it would take 20 to 30 minutes to get from one place to another. I can be at Argonne in 30 minutes, and there's plenty of parking out there. So, <laughs> so I think it was more attitude. Uh, Jed, okay. more more attitude and not um, seeing as clearly as people have at Berkeley the opportunity. Of course, you know, the Berkeley lab historically grew out of the campus. It was Lawrence's lab. 
Yeah. So the history is different too. And that, yeah, that I think true. changed people's attitudes. Well, good. Well, I'm glad you're getting them together. I, I spent time at Wheaton University and there was a little bit of collaboration between that really small school and Oregon National Lab. But it's nice to know that the, the place that should have the most collaboration is finally getting a chance to do that. And I'm I'm really excited that uh, that the University of Chicago has an engineering program now. I think it does add a lot to one of uh, you know the top schools, certainly in the center of the country, the, the, the one of the top schools. So well, and, the, and Chicago you know, has supported this largely because it was the idea of the president in a phenomenal way. We have a brand new building. I've hired uh, about 35 new faculty members. Um, we've made sure that many of them want to interact with Argonne. We now have 200 graduate students and uh, an undergraduate program that has, you know, about 50 students a year in it. So, you know, it's really gone from zero to 60 or something like that uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> That's great. So what's next for you now that you've gotten it going and it's pretty much the size that it needs to be? Are you looking to uh, yourself be a university president now that you've worked with uh, Bob <laughs> Zimmer and, and seen how, how important it is to have a good university president? If, if I was 10 years younger, the answer to that would be yes. But, you know, I turned 70 last uh, fall and... Um, you know, and, and I'm really committed to this. I mean, the big news in the last year is that um, the um, Pritzker family uh, gave a gift in uh, 2019 of um, $100 million to the university to name our school. So uh, we used to be called the Institute for Molecular Engineering. Now we're the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering. And because of that gift, the university has said we can double in size over the next decade, and they're going to build another building for us. So, um, so there's this still a lot the more to, to do here. Yeah, this is yeah. not the time to leave. No, yeah, I exactly, yeah. exactly. I, I'm, yeah. This is going to be it for me. You know. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, Wonderful. And I don't know how much longer. Uh, you know, but there's still a you know at least a decade's worth of work to do. I don't know if I'm going to work till I'm eighty, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, you look great. You really look great. And then has, has your research, you, you mentioned your research about um, nanoparticles that can get through the liver, go to places like your heart that are getting clogged up with plaque and help maybe get rid of the plaque. Um, has that research uh, been going along and when did it get started and where is it at right now? Well, the, 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 this biomedical line that is a principal direction of ours really started uh, back in Santa Barbara when... Uh, we were working on some synthetic molecules that um, we call peptide amphiphiles. And they, the idea is to link a peptide, meaning a small piece of protein, with a lipid molecule so that you could get the biological activity just of the peptide you want, you know, not, not the, the whole secondary and tertiary structure of a protein. But uh, create a self-assembled nanoparticle uh, by attaching a lipid tail to the peptide. So you get a lipid core with a peptide uh, coat. And uh, interestingly, I, I got to know um, another, uh, well, a prominent uh, uh, molecular biologist, I guess you'd call him, Erki Ruslati. I don't know if that name means anything to you, but he's the guy who discovered that RGD was the uh, ligand that integrin molecules seek out. And we started a collaboration exactly on what I'm saying, using these peptide amphiphile nanoparticles to target atherosclerotic plaque. And we showed that we could get these things to home to atherosclerotic plaque in mice. He's gone on to do different things, and, and I've sort of moved this toward more therapeutic applications. Um, what can you put in the cores of these nanoparticles that uh, not only allow you to diagnose atherosclerotic plaque, but actually can carry some kind of therapeutic agent to them? And, and, and without being totally mysterious, the kind of therapeutic agents that we're bringing are anti-inflammatory compounds 
because atherosclerosis is fundamentally uh, a result of inflammation that caused, it's either caused by lipid buildup in the endothelial lining or by disturbed blood flow and, and vortices. And, and so we've developed some interesting ways that uh, actually are having some success. And, and, not, and I've, I've said atherosclerosis, but there's other conditions that it seems to work for too. That's so wonderful. So do you think it could turn into a therapeutic that people with plaques in their heart and, you know, possible stroke, potential stroke victims might be able to use? Maybe. The the problem with that exactly, uh, and we're still hopeful that it might, is, and and this happens with any kind of drug or therapeutic, is who do you give it to and when and why? And, you know, atherosclerosis is such a slow developing disease. It's not clear, you know, would you give it to every 50 year old or something? Or would you just check out what's going on? Or, you know, maybe those with a personal or a family history of some kind of heart disease. But this is where I'm very excited exactly right now. Uh, We've discovered that these exact same particles that reduce the a rate of growth of atherosclerotic plaques in mice uh, work well for another much more immediate indication, which is uh, something that happens in kidney dialysis. When patients need kidney dialysis, an operation is done to speed up the blood flow and shorten the time that they have to be on the dialysis machine called an arteriovenous fistula. An artery is connected to a vein. And that is advantageous for reducing the dialysis time. Um, but this dis- this disturbs the blood flow. It creates vortices. And in 30% or more of the patients um, downstream of this fistula, the, the blood vessel starts to close off. It's a different phenomenon from atherosclerosis. Uh, but it's still caused by the inflammation of the disturbed blood flow, and we found that our same nanoparticles can uh, stop that uh, so-called stenosis due to uh, the arteriovenous fistula. And the thing is that here you know exactly what patients need it, and this kind of problem develops in a month or two, not a decade or two. So it's much more targeted. And then on the experimental side, uh, we've done this work so far in mice, but uh, the next thing we want to do is use larger animals such as pigs. And from an experimental point of view, you can do four of these fistulas in one pig because they have four limbs. And so you can get your data a a lot quicker. So we're we're kind of hoping to make some serious inroads. And and we we filed a patent for this. And uh, I think we... That might be where this plays out most uh, most uh, effectively. So that's another reason why I'm not looking for a university presidency. I'd actually like to see <laughs> this thing. I've been able, it's been very satisfying to me to be able to continue to have an active research program while still having serious administrative responsibilities. That's, that's a, a, a function of how I've decided to do the job and how... The, the environment at uh, Minnesota and Santa Barbara and Berkeley and Chicago has nurtured that as well. Wow, that's so great. I'm so glad to hear a little bit more about what you've been up to. It's <laughs> just been a wonderful pleasure to see you again. Thank you for spending some time on our show. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much, Jed.